Good afternoon. Um, this is Bonnie Orms for NUR 100, um, the long-term care um, program at Beckville College. I do want to discuss Chapter 44. Um, now, a requirement for you to proceed with clinicals is you have to have um, CPR. It is recommended that you go through American Heart Association. Um, some locations offer um, basic life support that is not through American Heart Association, and some of our clinical facilities will permit you to do that. But there are a handful that requires um, your basic life support to be through American Heart Association. Um, so if that's, it's probably better if you're going to pay for it to go through American Heart. That way, depending on where you're um, scheduled for clinical, that you don't have to repay for the certica certification to be through American Heart. So I do want to stress that. Um, so basic emergency care. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into great detail for this. Um, because you're going to get it again. Um, I do want to highlight some things for you. Um, so some key terms. So anaphylaxis, what is that? Um, it is simply a life-threatening sensitivity to an antigen. The very first one I'm thinking of is a bee sting. There are a lot of individuals who are highly sensitive to bees and their stings. Um, if they are stung, um, their whole body swells up and it becomes life-threatening when their throat closes because they have no airway. Um, same thing with children with peanut allergies. So if they're in school, even if a classmate in the classroom um, is eating peanut butter, something that they touch with their peanut butter hands, um, and then the child with the sensitivity will come up and touch it, um, and then maybe they touch their face because this is something children do, um, then that can cause an anaphylactic anaphylactic reaction. That's why it's very important to know um, if there is an allergy in the classroom and notify all the parents um, just so we can completely um, limit any exposure just for that child. Um, so convulsion, another word for convulsion is seizure. Um, respiratory arrest. So that is simply when um, you stop breathing. Um, at that point, you're going to have to implement CPR. Um, so shock. So what is shock? It results when organs and tissues do not get enough blood. Um, and then sudden cardiac arrest is when the heart stops suddenly and um, without warning. So they went into cardiac arrest. Um, emergency care. So this is first aid is um, emergency care given to an ill or injured person. Um, basically, this is to prevent death. Um, so sometimes if you're traveling and um, you come across a um, motor vehicle accident and you just kind of want to look at the situation, is the person safe? Um, is it okay for them to remain in their vehicle if they are seriously injured until help arrives? Um, you know, you kind of want to assess that inf information before you go removing someone. The recommendation is that you not remove them unless um, it is a life-threatening situation. For instance, is the car on fire? Is there gas leaking? Um, because the slightest spark um, will ignite that gasoline. So at that point, you know, obviously, yes, remove the person from the vehicle and get them to safety, um, but do so in protecting their um, spinal column um, and then their neck. So you don't want to manipulate their back in any way. Um, and that is just certain things, the risk is going to have to outweigh, you know, the benefit is going to have to outweigh the risk at that particular point. So just those are some things that are coming to my mind for you to think about. Um, so when you come up on an accident, um, activate your emergency response system. So that could mean, hey, I need help. Will you call 911 or you dialing 911 and waiting for further instructions? If you are the individual dialing 911, do not hang up. Place it on speakerphone and follow whatever directions um, that the call the um, operator is giving you. If the, a bystander is with you and they're on the phone, um, just ask them to remain on the phone until um, officer arrives or help arrives, okay? Um, so just be mindful of that. 
A lot of the times if you're in a nursing home when this occurs, um, so for instance, if you go in to take vitals and Mr. Smith, you go in, um, maybe he was fine an hour ago, but you go in now and he's blue. Okay, at that point, yell for ha help and start your CPR. Um, in the hospital settings, they have the code blue button on the wall. And once you hit that, basically everyone comes running. Um, other than that, you're going to have to use your voice um, and yell for help um, if needed. So death is expected in persons with terminal illness. Um, usually these persons are not resuscitated. Um, when you're in clinicals with me, one of the very first things I'm going to ask you to find is um, once you look, you know, you're assigned a patient, you're going to know their name. You're going to know their room number. I want you to know what their code status is. Are they DNR? Um, do they have a do not resuscitate order? Um, do they have a durable power of health care? Those are things that's important to know because if you go in to assess your patient and they're blue, um, do you initiate CPR right away or you just let them go? Um, because, you know, individuals are not necessarily happy if they have a do, uh, do not resuscitate order and you resuscitate them. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, these, those things are typically on the front of an individual's chart, um, but make sure you're passing that information along in report. Um, make sure you're looking and look just in the habit of looking it up whenever you're taking care of patients. Um, promoting safety and comfort. So during emergencies, any contact with blood, body fluids, secretions, and excretions, um, be sure you're using personal protective equipment and your standard precautions. Um, so treat everyone, even if you know them personally, as though um, they have an infectious disease. That's going to keep you safe. Um, some of the instances with um, some of the nursing staff now, they treat everyone as though they have the flu um, in hopes to reduce the amount of COVID cases in our nation. Um, so basically just treating everyone as though they're sick, um, even if they're not showing active symptoms. That's kind of why we have to stay home. Um, comfort. So mental comfort is important during emergencies. Help the person feel safe and secure, provide reassurance and explanations about their care, and use a calm approach. So if you go into a room to take care of a patient and you're in a panic, what is that going to do for your patient? It's going to put them in a panic. But if you go in in a calm demeanor and you're compassionate and you're showing um, complete interest in that person, that's going to ease their concern as well. So um, just think about that as you're um, taking care of your patients. Something I, I want to throw out there, um, when you're in a long-term care facility and the fire alarm goes off, initially, you know, as we're growing up, we hear, you know, we have to completely evacuate. Everyone go outside to a safe area that's pretty determined and meet up there. Well, in long-term care facilities, um, the walls are, have um, firewalls in between. So typically when the alarms go off, you need to make sure every resident is in their room and the door is closed, okay? Um, and that should help in the event um, of a fire. That's going to decrease the spread a lot quicker. Now, if an individual's room is on fire, I'm telling you, please don't put them in their room and close the door. Um, but it's going to decrease some of the smoke. If you need to, you can place um, wet towels on the base of the door to keep some of the smoke out. Um, but you, you know, you're completely outnumbered. So you can't be in every patient's room um, during that time. But if they are safe in their rooms um, and you just wait for further instructions, you cannot evacuate the building. You have to stay in there with the residents. Now, when the fire department come in and assess the situation, they will let you know, okay, well, maybe we need to close the east wing, for example. So everyone in the east wing, we need to move to the west wing to keep them safe. Um, They've done that in the past. It doesn't happen very often. Um, so even if you're in a hospital setting, you're going to have the same um, situation. Just make sure the patient's doors are closed. Um, so when you hear that alarm, you know, just tell them, it's like, you know, we're having a drill at the moment. Um, we'll get them back out um, of their room as soon as it's safe or we have the all clear. Um, so chain of survival 
and basic life support for adults. Um, this is recommended by the American Heart Association. Um, action taken for a heart attack, sudden um, cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest or stroke, um, and choking. So you want to assess, um, recognize cardiac arrest and activate in the EMS. So um, you want to ensure that you are getting help coming because after about five minutes of chest compressions, you're going to be tired. So if you've already implemented um, calling EMS before you started those compressions, um, that just means that, you know, help is on the way when you start tiring out. Um, early CPR is important as well as early defibrillation. Um, so most facilities are equipped with defibrillators, um, but if not, that's why it's important to have um, EMS on the way. And then early advanced care. This is given by EMS staff, doctors, as well as nurses. Um, they give medication and perform life-saving measures. Um, so yeah, so what is cardiac, sudden cardiac arrest? So it is when all circulation stops, all breathing stops, um, and within moments of the breathing stopping, um, permanent brain damage can occur. Um, that is also known as anoxic brain injury. Um, but the individual does not show any response breathing and they could be no breathing or abnormal breathing. And that's something like an ag um, agonal breath. So every once in a while you'll hear <laughs> kind of thing, like a gasping, um, I know that was kind of funny, I'm sorry. Um, but it is kind of like that. Um, and people have mistakenly thought that somebody overdosing was doing that, that they're still breathing. It is not, and they're not getting enough oxygen to sustain their brain or their body. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, they're gonna need rescue breath as well as CPR. Um, respiratory arrest can occur in situations of drowning, of stroke, choking, drug overdose, electric shock, um, smoke inhalation, suffocation, heart attack coma, as well as other injuries. So your rescue breaths, um, you want to ensure that you're opening the airway. And if you're not sure how to do that, you can check on page 597. Um, you want to give one breath for every five to six seconds in adults, and then give each breath over one second. The chest should rise when the breaths are given. So you're going, as you're giving the breath, you just want to look for a chest rise. Um, you're going to check for the pulse every two minutes. If there is no pulse, please begin CPR. Um, your chest compressions, the heart, brain, and other organs must receive blood. So that is the premise behind your chest compressions. Um, figure 42-2 kind of gives you an example of the sternum. Now, um, be mindful of the xiphoid process. So when you have to give compressions, stay away from that. Um, if you're giving compressions over the xiphoid process, um, that could break off. It's just simply a piece of cartilage at the end of the sternum. That could puncture the diaphragm. That could puncture a lung. And that can also puncture the heart. So that's why it's very important not to give compressions over the xiphoid process. To prevent that. Um, so yeah. I'm not going to go into CPR in depth. Um, just because you're going to get that training um, soon enough. So um, recovery position. After you perform CPR and you've given respiratory breaths. Um, recovery breaths. There is a recovery position. Um, if the individual comes out of it, maybe they start breathing on their own and they have a pulse, that you can place them in this recovery position. So log roll the person um, to keep their head, neck, and spine straight. You can use your hand to support their head. Do not use this position if the person might have neck or spinal injuries. Um, but just let you know that that is there. So hemorrhage, what is that? So that is simply um, the excessive loss of blood um, in a short amount of time. If the bleeding is not stopped, a person will die. Fainting, so it is the sudden loss of consciousness um, from an inadequate blood supply to the brain. Sometimes this can occur 
from hunger, fatigue, fear, and pain, which are common causes. Um, some people faint at the sight of blood. Um, standing in one position for a long time and being warm, crowded in the room or other causes. Dizziness, perspiration, and blackness before the eyes are warning signs. Shock um, results when organs or tissues do not get adequate um, blood supply. Um, it could be related to blood loss or heart attack. Um, burns and um, severe infection may be um, causes. Signs and symptoms include low or falling blood pressure, um, rapid and weak pulse, rapid respirations, cold and moist pale skin, thirst, restlessness, um, confusion and loss of consciousness as shock worsens. Shock is possible when any person acutely ill or severely injured. Um, so you want to follow the rules in box 44-1. Keep the person lying down. Maintain an open airway and um, control any bleeding. Begin CPR if cardiac arrest occurs. I have gone through anaphylaxis. Um, it is a life-threatening sensitivity to an antigen. Ana means without. Phylaxis means protection. The reaction can occur within seconds. Um, signs and symptoms are included on page um, 604. Um, stroke or CVA. Um, occurs when the brain is suddenly deprived of blood supply. Usually only part of the brain is affected. So if I'm showing um, left side at weakness, the injury is probably on my right side. If I'm showing right side at weakness, the injury is probably on my left side. So just be mindful of that. Um, seizures or convulsions are violent and sudden contractions um, or tremors of muscle groups. Um, movements are uncontrolled. The person may lose consciousness. Um, seizures are caused by an abnormality in the brain. Causes include head injury um, during birth or from trauma. Um, high fever, brain tremors, poisoning, and nervous system disorders or infections. Now, there's epilepsy. Now, that one... Um, is a brain disorder in which clusters of nerves sometimes signal abnormally. Um, the person can have strange sensations, emotions, and behavior. Sometimes there are seizures, muscle spasms, and a loss of consciousness. A single seizure does not mean epilepsy. Um, although if this is an individual's first seizure, please have them seek medical attention. Um, Children and young adults are commonly affected. However, epilepsy can develop any time in a person's life. It can occur in any problem affecting the brain. Um, there is no cure at this time, although there are several treatments. Um, and then there are several types of seizures. So the main ones are a partial seizure where only one part of the brain is involved. A body part may jerk. Um, and a person may, um, has hearing or vision problems and stomach discomfort. The person does not lose consciousness. So then there's also a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, also known as a grand mal um, seizure. So you can find these on page 605. So um, if a person is sitting or standing and falls to the floor, um, the body is rigid because all muscles contract at once. Um, this clonic phase follows um, muscle groups contract and relax, causing jerking or twitching movements. Um, oftentimes, the person may become incontinent of urine as well as bowel. Um, and then a deep sleep is common after this seizure. I mean, just think of all the energy expelled um, for the seizure, and at that point, they're just completely wiped out and they go to sleep. Um, generalized absence or petite mal seizures is typically when um, it may only last a few seconds. There is a loss of consciousness. The individual may twitch um, a lot of the times only their eye eyeballs or they can just have a staring glaze. So they're just 
completely glazed over, staring into space. So if you ask them questions, they're not responding, okay? Um, no first aid is necessary. However, you should guide the person away from dangers, um, such as stairs, streets, hot stoves, um, fireplaces, etc. You please understand that you cannot stop a seizure, so you just want to maintain the indiv individual's safety as they are in a seizure. Um, do not leave the person alone. Um, lower the person safely to the floor so they don't cause um, further injury to themselves. Note the time the seizure started. So this is something that's huge. Um, you can place something soft under the individual's head to protect them. Um, you may want to place them on their side um, or you can cradle their head in their um, lap. Loosen any tight jewelry or clothing they may be wearing. Um, do not put any object or your fingers between the person's teeth. The person can bite down on their fingers and they'll clamp down um, and they're not aware of it. So it's not like they're going to be able to let go. Do not try to stop the seizure or control the movements and then move furniture, equipment, and sharp objects away from the person. Um, he or she may strike these objects during the, during the seizure. So lastly, I want to discuss burns. Um, burns may um, severely disable an individual. Um, burns may even cause death. Um, most burns occur at home. Um, typically infants, children, and um, older persons are at risk. Um, common causes of burns are scolds from hot liquids, playing with matches and lighters, electrical injuries such as placing something foreign in an um, electrical outlet, cooking accidents, um, falling asleep while smoking, fireplaces, space heaters are big um, reasons for fire in a home. Um, sunburn is even um, a potential with burns as well as chemical burns. Now, I do want to say this. When Tristan was um, two, he, you know, I, he doesn't transition well. So I um, was making some chicken nuggets and sweet potato fries in the oven because I don't like to fry the kids. You know, I found the kids like it better out of the oven. So I started the oven and placed um, the tray in the oven and then walked to the restroom. So, you know, I was only in there not even a minute Um by the time I urinated and washed my hands and came back, he had taken his sippy cup and opened the lid uh, of open the oven door and tossed his sippy cup into the oven. He's kind of mimicking what I was doing. Um, and then it landed on the bottom burner and caught um, my stove on fire. Um, you know, that was a scary situation. I wouldn't think that the two-year-old would be able to start a fire like that, but it occurred. Um, the plastic kind of melted. Um, I, we were able to contain it, um, but I, I just felt like I couldn't do anything at that point because, you know, here I, you know, here I am, ten feet away from my kitchen, and he still caught my kitchen on fire. Um, there was another instance to where um, he placed his sippy cup in the microwave, and um, one of those, um, it was a thermal, um, oh, what you re oven mitt basically. And it was lined with, um, the silver inside the oven mitt. Well, he'd place that in the cup inside the microwave and just hit the button. It has an automatic add 30 seconds to it. So inside the microwave, um, that, you know, just that one little simple button, I think he was four at this time. Um, that silver lining inside that oven mitt sparked and ignited the rest of the oven mitt and then started my microwave on fire. So my two appliances had to be replaced shortly thereafter, um, but it was just little things like that. So I had to ensure, you know, the locks um, on the appliances when we weren't in the room. So that was kind of frustrating, not to mention, you know, having to replace appliances and going through the insurance claim. And then they were like, okay, what were you doing with your kids? Why weren't you watching? You know, but I was in the room and I walked out to grab another child and I came back and it started, um, you know, within 30 seconds. And then it already engulfed, um, part of the cabinet above it.
you know, I mean, it, it was completely accidental, but those things can happen at the blink of an eye. So that's basically the point I want to convey. Um, you know, in my story of children can starting things that you wouldn't think would normally happen. Um, so the types of burns, there is a first degree burn, which is typically the epidermis only. Um, they are painful, but not very severe. So who's had a sunburn? Okay. Um, that's typically your first degree burn. So then there is a partial thickness or a second degree burn. Um, it involves the epidermis as well of, as parts of the dermis. They're very painful. Um, nerve endings may be exposed. Um, so you're going to need medical treatment for that regardless. Um, and then there are third degree burns, um, which involve the entire epidermis and the dermis. It also involves fat, muscle, and bone that may be injured or destroyed. Um, these burns are not painful. Any idea why? Because there is nerve damage. Um, if you have no nerve, you can't feel the pain. So the pain, you know, the burn is that serious that if an individual is saying, oh, it doesn't hurt, that should be a signal to you. That is a um, third degree burn. Um, some burns may be minor and others are severe. Severity depends on burn size and death or the body part involved. Um, burns to the face, ears, hands, and feet are more serious burns to the arm and the leg. Um, infants, young children, and older persons are at high risk for death. So if an individual is burned, there is in the body a fluid exchange. Um, if they are burned and touching an electrical source and they're getting electrocuted. So as a parent, if you see a child stick something in an electrical unit, don't go grabbing them to pull them away because at that point you're going to electrocute yourself. You need something in between before you grab them. Um, as a barrier, so a towel, a blanket, something to where you're not in contact with them. You're breaking that electrical current to remove them. Um, you can't stop the burning process, but you can eliminate the um, burn itself. Um, do not remove the burned clothing. Um, remove hot clothing, clothing if it's not sticking to a skin. So, for instance, if a child spills... Um, fluid from a, um, the oven burning, um, like I'm boiling spaghetti, for instance, and they pull that down, remove those clothing because the clothing become hot and continue the source. Um, and I just want to say from personal experience, um, in the summertime when you're using um, lotions to protect for burns, um, to avoid the sprays. I have had personal experience with Tristan. We applied the spray... Um, barrier while he was in the sun, the sunblock, and it actually caused a second degree burn. He had blisters on his shoulders from those. Um, so I've, after that, my personal experience, I've always used the thick um, oxide um, lotion to basically lather his face, arms, and shoulders with um, just because of that. I mean, I, he had big blisters on his shoulders and I felt terrible. Um, I thought I was doing right by using the spray um, sunblock, even though it said, I think it was 75 SPF, he still ended up with those blisters. And, you know, the physician had said um, it has something to do with the oil base that actually um, helped with those burns. So as a result, never again will I even purchase the oil um, base spray lotion for any of my kids. Um, so I just kind of want to throw that out there for my personal experience. Um, so yeah, so that's going to conclude basic emergency care. Um, you can review the questions in the back. Um, that's basically where you can find all the exam questions. Um, I did draw them from there. Um, thank you and have a blessed day.